it. Thank you. Is this on? Is it on? Can we hear? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. I don't really think I need to do this, but I'll do it anyway. Um, Willem Dafoe is a uh, original member of the Worcester Group, and he's been in a few films. Uh, when I asked Marina how to describe her, she said, if you say no to me, it's only the beginning. <laughs> so, uh, welcome. I just want to jump right in. When did you meet Bob Wilson? God, this long and funny story. I can't believe that this performance that I'm sitting here to start with. It's really um, amazing to jump from the your life into the conversation. Okay, so, uh, I met him in 71, and uh, he came to Belgrade to direct um, his, one of his pieces. Uh, well, actually, it was only him on the stage, and they announced him in all newspapers, the genius of Iowa, and he was actually from Texas. It's totally, <laughs> I don't know why he got this genius from Iowa. And uh, he was performing Student Cultural Center. This was the only place we actually got from the Tito, uh, you know, after doing kind of demonstrations in 68, we want to have this, the kind of cultural place. And uh, the place was used for the secret police uh, to play chess and the wife to gossip and do needlework. And finally, students got the place. So he came to perform there. And the performance was very long. It, it went, you know, really after the midnight. And I remember so vividly that the, the, the guy who was, you know, the ex-officer from the partisan-type army came three, four times, the doorman, you know, who want to go to sleep and say, I, can you f finish this business? And, you know, Bob was going on and on. And in one point he came with pistol and said, shoot everybody if you then get out. <laughs> and then they really got out. And that was the when I met Bob first. <laughs> Very radical. Is, maybe that made you interested in durational art? No, Bo no don't go that way. I was okay. completely independent from Bob. <laughs> Bob came and left. I already was doing performances. The beginning of this performance, um, as it said in the program, um, this was supposed to be Alex Poots, me, uh, the artistic director of the Manchester Festival, and he, now here at the Armory. Um, you said to Bob, was it 2009? Uh, you mean the... The, the funeral. The funeral, 2000, yes. Yeah, 2000. you said, I want you to direct my funeral, and he said, only if I can direct your life. Two, yes, a two together goes very well. And then how do you get from that to what we all just saw? How does that? Oh, this was a long process, you know, that first of all, uh, you know, uh, he, I have to give the Bob all the material, my, my writings, uh, my diaries, uh, pieces of my work, and uh, all the, you know, the, tragic stories as you've been hearing this night. And then he put all this together and he look and he said, okay, I'm definitely not interested in your work. Everybody knows your work. I only wanted to, you know, to have this, uh, this life, to stage the life. And that's how we started. And, you know, he, the first, the most funny thing when he auditioned everybody, so that there came this, um, this uh, the actor, Carlos, and he, you know, he really, he's, you know, not so, he had to play me as a ba as a child, so he's a smaller man, and he had this mustache, and I said, but he probably he will, you know, he have to take this mustache. He played me, so absolutely not. So he played me with mustache all the way, <laughs> <laughs> apart of everything else. But anyway, I think he done an amazing job because he made this work so abstract, and to me, the best solution was Willem because Willem really could remember these things. I could never could <laughs> remember half of the material that Willem remembers so well. It's just incredible. And how, and how did it happen? How did you finally decide to work together? The Willem wanted, you have to ask Willem. He wanted to work with Bob a long time, and I love Willem anyway, and we are friends, and we also live across the street from each other. I could see his house, you know, from my window. But and, you had never... Uh, and the booster, no, we knew it, but we never worked. And the booster group also, what he was used to work, it's, you know, it, it was in my, in my basement, so I would always take the chairs from the booster group if I make my own party. So it was a lot of connections. You just say hi, women. And... <laughs> yes. Yeah. There was lots of occasions we look out of the window, yeah. Let's but, not go into details. <laughs> but you do so much of the heavy lifting here. I mean, you are the, the dominant voice of the whole show. Yeah, um... You know, when Bob asked me, I always liked his work. And um, when Bob asked me, I knew 
that it was, uh, it was called Life and Death of Marina Abramovich. I knew Marina was going to be performing. I knew Anthony was going to uh, be performing. Those were all good things for me. What I was going to do, I didn't know. He didn't really know. He just uh, knew he had a lot of text. He didn't know what he was going to do with it. It was before he really had staging ideas. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was interesting because he said, I don't know what, I, I, I just want you to help with this piece. What was the first thing that came that helped form what it became? What was the first well, germ? I think uh, one of the first things is he, he goes very fast with the architecture of the space. And one of the things he had was this idea that I was set apart from the formal frame, frame of the proscenium. So that really shaped something right out. It's not really a narrator. It's kind of a, a little subset. It's a little thing off to the side. So that's, that was initially. Putting me in that spot um, made me like a front of the curtain man. <laughs> and then as we developed the mise-en-scene more, I would you know, come and go in and out of the actual scenes. But my real home was outside of the frame, commenting and trying to facilitate you know, just really being the connective tissue for all the scenes. But also it was in the, in the make you possibility to you recreate your own, actually, world and then coming in and out. And then normally in other theaters, we always have this stage where we we'll go up and down. But here, because of the, you know, Armory was never built as a theater, we could not do that. So the, I think in Armory, my point of view is much better the idea of coming as a rail in and out. So you're really like a traveling with the story and Isn't going out with the story. You, you normally, uh, if you've seen the piece, uh, I come in on this uh, from the side, but normally it's on a hydraulic that goes up and down. So. Yeah. I, I do kind of miss, you know, the, the reveal of yeah, coming that, up, you know, like, <laughs> I, know. I feel like Joe Stalin or something, you know. I think everybody wants to just rise yeah, up on rise once, up, you know, oh! <laughs> and take off. But it's then it's also, a little like sliding off. <laughs> no, it's not but a, also just like the public like to know, there's like, like a, sorry, guy. something like a 420 changes of the light, light cues, because Bob Wilson is like an absolute master in light. And, uh, there's so much of the rehearsals that we literally have to stay from the day one with the full makeup and full costumes, which no any director do ever, only he. And to be, he can't just have a prop and fix the light. No, he have to absolutely have the person in real outfit of performance. And then he will just go on for hours, like a 13% blue, no go to 60% green, go to, you know, 102% of the gray, and on and on and on, and drive me crazy. <laughs> because, you know, it's not that I don't have patience, but I have patience for public, but not for light. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yeah, I think you've proved that you're very patient. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but still. The, still so, hard. so when there have been changes, at least since Manchester, I'm sure there are many changes that I didn't notice, but when, say, this film of the drum, which was not there originally, rolling down the hill, when a change like that is made, is there a discussion, or does just Bob come in and say, "Here's the drum," and you say, "Okay"? I mean, no, no, no. It's it's much. It's very it's different. Practical. It's it's not. It's, you know, it's very different because the first of all, the entire scene where the drum appears with the spirit cooking recipes, they present in a certain way because I've been teaching for you know more than 25 years. So the let's say the the there is a, uh, the people who actually came with their own ideas. Like Akira, she's a very good uh, English performer, and she, in one performance, her own performance, she's rolling the steps for a long period of time upside down, or Amanda Cogan, who washed the, her dress. So they're really performances of that particular people who are participating. And they are just taking the parts of them, and they have the, the you know, if you've seen the program, they have the, the credits for these performances. And before we had another person who was my ex-student, Ivan Cevic, we, 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 we exchanged for the Nico Vasciagliari, who is Italian artist, and he came with new material, and he's, he's worked with music structure. So his material, he showed to, the, to Bob, and Bob think that, that this piece where he actually rolling the drum through the forest is very beautiful. So that was, you know, his piece came into this as a, his part of, of that scene. His collaboration. That was fantastic. It made a great sound. Anyone who's worked in music, I think, yeah. has wanted to roll a drum set down. Right. A, so the people yeah. bring their own ideas into the piece. The, you said something about him 
originally saying everyone knows your work, which might be a slight exaggeration. I think what you've ended up with seeing it several times is you can come to this, like you never hear the, the name Marina, unless I missed something. I could have missed something. Um, and there's this very distinct feeling now of these, these people going through things and it isn't just some sort of recap of all your work or even necessarily your life. Mm. But also when the Willem is reading, which I think is very, for me, the most difficult scene in all, when he have this, he's buried in these pieces of paper and he's random reading whatever comes out as a line of my biography, which is all, every single line is true. And I never know, because he never knows which he's going to pick up. It's always different remakes for every evening. It's, it's really, um, it's, it's so, in, it's personal, but in the same time is impersonal because there's no names mentioned. There is ever these characters that don't have names, as me don't have names. So the, the idea, this is the genius idea of Paul Wilson to make so abstract, that actually this biography is anybody's biography. Everybody can project you know, whatever story he wants from his own life into it. So there are no names, there are no specific names in, it's, in it's any interesting way. If it they're didn't... the men in my life, but they don't specifically tell them which, who are there. I mean, friends know, but generally nobody knows. Well, it's funny seeing it in 2011 and then you hear news from 2012 and 2013, you're like, oh, I'm so happy, that was great. <laughs> you know, because you know, before there's like 2000, you know, 89 tax problems, 90 but, but, this. Yeah, but you know what is very moving. This time moving, now there was a couple of good things. In which is very moving in my, about this scene, at least for me, that when you die at the end of your life, that's what your life comes. It's like one sentence, one year, that's it. You know, in the end, you edit it to almost nothing. And that scene is so much about the temporality of human life. That it just becomes a series of lines. That yeah, you could... the series of lines, and, you know, and these possessions, pieces of paper. You know, when you, somebody dies from your family, you go to clean apartment. What is left? You, that's it. All the newspaper. All these newspapers, yeah. Are there, and so those are God, you get random. so sad now. Let's get more, <laughs> <laughs> let's get more happy parts. I think your house is pretty clean from what I know. But you, but you see how important is the delivery of, of Willem that he put so much humor in it. Otherwise, this would be tragic all the way. But Willem really make this life. <laughs> it, changes, it changes from, there are moments that are so, that are so manic and exaggerated, and then when you read that, that, final, that final series of events, mm -hmm. it's sort of, it's touching. The more subdued you become, the more it's sort of, it's drifting out, like it's, it's moving into death. It feels a bit like that. Yeah, I, you know, I just, I'm like a thing that serves the scene, and uh, that's what's required then. So I don't even think about it so much. It's just you try to, you know, it's like there's an orchestra in your uh, instrument, and you try to, you know, do your, <laughs> proper uh, part. But also, I, I love the a part of this, how the Bob uh, constructed the, the platform scene, when he's telling the story about my aunt and my father and what else, and that platform scene, what all these individuals look like a cartoon, you know, mm -hmm. from what I, you know, from kind of Star Wars movie or something. No, it's, it's amazing. It, are there scenes that feel particularly challenging on different nights, or one that you're always sort of gearing yourself up to, to get through? Um, no, they're all, they're all, they, you know, with all performing, I think that the challenges slide around. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, because the, you're always, you know, one of the most difficult stuff is, is just reanimating things and keep, keeping it fresh, particularly with such a formal theater like this, where it's so precise. It's really about keeping it alive and not having the structure, have the structure guide you and have you be totally dedicated to the structure, but be able to jump off on it. And, and where it goes dead and where it flattens out always switches. So I think that's where your challenges happen. You know, when you feel it going away, you feel like you're getting routinized or losing its, um, its life. Yeah, no, it did, it did not feel routinized at all. No, it if doesn't. anything, it feels I mean, more Bob has here. structured something that's really fun for me to perform and, and quite challenging, but I never think, oh, God, there's that scene, and oh, I can sail through this scene. And I, because yeah. one nice thing also, when, you're, when, you're, when you don't have any moments to reflect, you're just in the scene. So when you hop on the bus, I think 
you know, my only anxieties I ever have are right before. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. the anticipation of taking the leap, which is quite typical. It's and, and also with some of the, some of the uh, fast speed of some of the uh, speaking, you really have to reach further than your brain can go, and uh, that's a little scary sometimes. You mean like when you're telling the rat story? Yeah, not the rat story so much. The the backward story with a, you know with the 25 years of marriage. Of oh, the marriage. Speaking. Yeah, because you have to touch down. You have to make sense. But then there's also a musical element, you know. Because if you make, take repetition. it too slow and make it too reasonable, it drags and becomes maudlin. So you have to find a way to kind of lift it up, contact the music, con find the important parts and the important parts that uh, aren't important drop away. It's an interesting process. It becomes, it can be, that scene can be sort of terrifying. Yeah, it can the, be. The way that it builds. Yeah, you don't loops. know where it's going to go exactly. A lot depends on the audience, too. It doesn't feel like it's going to go anywhere particularly great. Uh, particularly great? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. It's not, it's not going to be a romantic stuff. moment. It's, um, let, me, let me just tell you some records that nobody knows, which we actually did today. So the scene from the red dress to go into this flying scene, he's telling the rat story. And we have 40, 80 seconds to change all the clothes and everything to get, you know, this all the hanging gears. And uh, it's always such a hell behind to do that and to look like so effortless. So today we brought all the records, 41 seconds. <laughs> it's I'm amazing. I'm afraid to ask what the other record is. How long, what's, how, what's the longest Nine time? Hours. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, there's just dry ice for an hour. And then... Oh, that, never mind. That's, that's, other, that's performance. This is theater. <laughs> it's a big difference. So you saw in Manchester and you saw here. What is for you the difference? It's the, I think it's the part where you're wondering, has your perception changed because of something personal or did they actually take something out? Like I can notice like, wait, that, um, that drum is new or the, the, when you're caddy corn and you have that discussion, that felt different. Uh, yeah. That felt like you were saying things you hadn't said before. Mm. Um, but it very much felt, the, the more I see it, the less it seems to be about a person named Marina Abramovich. It seems to be about this long arc of, of all of these tense things, the, the, the arguments, the, there's work, there's, there's fran this frantic thing in the first half. And then the second half is this, this gentle sort of movement towards that, you know, volcano of snow. But then tonight I was thinking, a volcano of snow is a pretty active thing. I mean, you're allegedly dying, but it's not very dead. A volcano of snow is pretty. But this is after life. I hope you believe in it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I sure do. Well, if there's going to be a volcano of snow, sure, okay. <laughs> but it, that felt to me like, huh, that's. It was optimism. The, the Bob told me, hang up there and smile, and I do. It is a very optimistic ending, Let's but I mean, see. but every time you see it, you focus on. I mean, the it's hard for me not to be completely absorbed in that uh, because the music, uh, the Basinski piece, is just hugely important to me. And, and when you're singing that song, that's usually when I lose it. Um, and that just that one simple structure, it looks like a child's bed. It's a jail. It's a house, and you're in the red, and it's just got this perfect sort of. You sort of can't believe you're seeing it. And the three black angels, you're like, wow. But you know, it's, the music is such an important part of the texture of this piece. And, and it's a really unique mixture between the Slavic uh, Svetlana Spajic and her group, and Anthony and his group of people he brought in. And it's never been done this way. You know, it's really that, I mean, the very it really first, works together so good, so that was well. stunning. The very first time I saw it, I was just, I couldn't believe. Because there'd be snatches of things I knew through the Basinski, and then, and then Anthony would, you know, come and on stage. And then also the, the way how it was put together, especially in, the, in the, 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 the last scene with the military scene before the ending of the first part, when you really have the, the Slavic group and this whole thing, and it goes into this whole idea of the, you know, artist manifesto and then turn into creativity song of Anthony, who really kind of created that wonderful image. Have you, the, have you had people who know more about that original music, that part of the world where, you, where you're from. Was, people have seen it and have reactions that Americans would never have. Have you had yeah, people, very people yeah. 
what's what's one of the strongest reactions that comes no to because mind? you know especially people who come from my part of the world and right. they get very emotional and it's what like you're bringing this kind of part of your own country here into America but this is like Bulgarian singing like the fado in Portuguese you don't need to know the words but there's emotional impact that you react because it's overtones and stuff like that so you have the definitely emotional reaction even if you don't know the words but Svetlana Spajic the she composed entire funeral music because in our country you know when somebody dies you, you can compose the song for the dying and uh, she did this, and it's great. I have it already, so I have nothing to do except to die. <laughs> it's, it's all organized. It's, okay. It sounds, um, where's, where's my time, human? Are we going to ask somebody for the public? Gotcha. Um, this may sound like a daft question because it's so simple, but what's with the death? Like, why, why that idea? That Make is it, so it, important. I mean, well, just because you're, you know, obviously, the you know, creative work is continuing. Your, your artistic production is not exactly slowing down. So when you say to him, "I want to stage my death," it's kind of there's sort of a joke there. Like you're it's not, not a joke. I, I mean, to tell you the truth, not a joke. I mean, you know, the, the really, it's an, it, an inversion. It, it's very strange to say, but I, this idea of staging my own death came after being in this funeral of Susan Zontag. That's how it starts. Really? I went to the Père Lachaise and, uh, in Paris where she was buried, and this was the funeral. And when I saw this funeral, I said, no, my funeral is going to be different. And it was very important. And she, for me, was a very important person. And I was very lucky to know her last four years of her life. And uh, I didn't want that kind of funeral. I want a funeral that is a celebration of life. And so I went to the lawyer and asked, uh, you know, to make this testament. When I say I want to have three marinas, because in my life is clearly three marinas. One is very fragile and little girl and crying all the time. The other one is really warrior and don't care about anything. Go for it. And the third one is, I think, quite spiritual. So there are three types of marina. And then I was thinking, okay, I want to be buried in three different places in the world. I live the longest, which is Belgrade, uh, Amsterdam, and New York. And of course, I can't split the, life, the, the dead body in three parts, so I have to be two fake and one real. But I, I, nobody will know where is the real body. And there will be simultaneous funeral. And I always wanted Anthony to sing, uh, you know, I did it my way. He never said yes, but I think he's going to be so sentimental when I die that he will do it probably. I'm not sure. <laughs> and since this was the idea, you see, it's artists have the freedom to think about these things. Plus, you know, yeah, in my country, we always said that, you know, the grandmother was always prepared to, to die. Uh, for 40 years, she had the clothes ready for the funeral. <laughs> and then when the poker dots was in fashion, she had the poker dots, the little stripes, the little, you know, the beige was a very big thing. But then she went to dark blue and she lived 103. So it's interesting, you just described your actual funeral plan, which of course has nothing to do no, really, no. we didn't have people sneaking around burying. No, no, fake because this, of spot. course, you know, this whole thing is very clear. This is a Bob Wilson life and that. Right. Of uh, anybody, but this is his his version, which is very different. And I'm just, I, I, you know, it's interesting. He literally, I give him all material, and he done whatever he wants. I never say anything, you know, that I should not do that he told me to do. So I'm completely like a tool in his in his production which is very liberating feeling. I didn't have no anything to say with this, which is which I really wanted to. I want to lose complete control to that my life look new to me, and it did. Well, there must be people leaving thinking that you did, you know, that the Nothing. focus of your I life did. was X or Y or Nothing. He thing. told me everything what I have to do, and I did. I mean, Willem knows this, it's true. What's that? That I never said anything, that, he, that I done what he told me to do. No, you were material. I was his material, and that's really important. This is why the piece is Bob Wilson life and that of my image. And that's his version. We are, we are in the material, yeah. Which yeah. is so good to do sometimes. A, a, a friend came the other day and, and she said, um, I had no idea that Marina and Willem were married for so long. <laughs> And I said, and I, I almost wanted to just let that just sit. leave it. <laughs> and just like wait for Google to sneak up and maybe take that one apart. But it's like, by the way, and then and then for a moment I was like, wait a minute, what? 
Maybe I don't know that. <laughs> um, we, uh, I think we have a microphone for questions, or we do, or we do, we don't. I, the rooms, okay. Yep. Uh, are there questions from humans here in the audience? I like the humans. Oh, here's one. A brave human. Um, so, oh, that's loud. Uh, so you come off as a very confident, determined, authentic person and a creator, and I'm wondering if there was a moment in your life that you can remember when you doubted your own uh, creativity, authenticity, drive to pursue something unique, and how you dealt with that. Please, I, I think I read it. <laughs> what? <laughs> there were many, uh, in, many entries in those, uh, in those dates where there was self-doubt and worry and true. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you mean me? You ask me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's in your life, and when you start as an artist, it's, uh, it's, it's such a long way, you know. And when I start really very early in, in ex Yugoslavia dealing with performance ideas, that was like uh, so difficult. And uh, people would ridicule me and write terrible things in newspapers. And, and uh, you know, and my father and mother was asked on party meetings you know, for explanation, you know, what, what, is, what, what is daughter doing, you know, naked, cutting communist star on the stomach or, or burning herself uh, on, the, on the square. I mean, really, I was, uh, it was all bad, badly seen. And somehow I always had the vision that what I'm doing was right. And even if the whole society around me was against it. And, uh, you know, and I mean, right now, in, 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 also in America, I exercise, I, I experience lots of criticism the, about my work generally, because the, the, the MoMA show was seen very well. But then my involvement in, uh, I don't know, with Lady Gaga or Jay-Z or the, the, my, the, my really love to fashion, it was seen, oh, you can't do this if you're doing that. And I don't like these boundaries. I like to take my freedom and do whatever I think is right, because I always think that your own vision and intuition, it's something that you have to follow against anything other people say. So that's what I've been doing since 40 years. <laughs> In the back. You have a very unconditional, um, different kind of loving mother. When you remember her after she passed away, do you sometimes smile when you remember her? And do you have any sweet memory of your mother? I, I, you know, when the Willem said, uh, in this uh, text, the uh, death of my mother, finally, I really meant. I had a very difficult relation to my mother. I don't have good memories. I never had good memories. I took care of her last days of her life because she suffered from total dementia. She couldn't recognize me. But if, if you have the mother who never kissed you in your life, it's not easy to deal with that. And I had a really big problems and uh, it was really hurting me. So I took care of her and, you know, I really feel free that she's not there and what I can do. But not only with, the fa with, the, with the everybody, my mother, my father, my aunt just died two days ago. This is the last one in the family. I just didn't have good relation with the, with my, with the family. So I, can you imagine how much I hate Christmas and New Year? I can't stand it. <laughs> just, and, and, you know, and that you have to deal with that and in a way, you know, exposing all these shameful feelings in a, in a form of theater. It's emotionally exhausting and incredibly difficult, but in the same time, it's the best therapy you can ever have. <laughs> because you know the, the story, the Willem stalling about the champagne glasses and my father, mother, whatever. It, every single rehearsal, I cry and cry and cry till the finally, the Bob said to me, can you stop this bullshit of crying? I said, but it's really so sad. But she said, yes, public have to cry, not you. No. So if something really bad happens, just call, call Bob. Call Bob. Bob, <laughs> Bob put this in a very sterile, and distant Bob, way. Bob will solve it for you. Anyway. But it's, I, I really think that, that the humor, it's so important. This is what Bob said. You remember, he always said, if you, if you take the tragic things and you make them tragic on the stage, they look like kitsch. But you can take tragic things and make really fun of them. They're deeper and, and, and they're better. You know? And that's what he done, really all the slapstick part of the first. Well, it feels she has this when you play her and she's in this regal black gown, but somehow that percussion 
makes her a little bit goofy. There's something that sort of undermines her. I'm perfect. only sorry that she's not live to see me playing her. That's really a sorry. <laughs> I want, that's a, because she summarized my mother in three, in three, three movements, the finger, the pointing, steps, and poof, slapping. That's perfection. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe perfection. somewhere she's seen it. Huh? Maybe she's seeing it now. <laughs> somewhere. Was there a, I thought I saw it. I, uh, sure. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, no, oh, no problem. Um, For the world. Is there any uh, perception or distinction between the audiences, between, say, Manchester, Toronto, and New York? Like, obviously, New York being both your hometowns, but just the reception you got in the different places? That you, you're going to tell this, you feel the audience. Yes, as you might expect, in a lot of places we uh, perform, maybe English isn't the first language, so uh, they miss some of the humor. But you may miss the text, but you may see in a different way because you're not worried about the text. And we do perform with subtitles in some places. True. Yeah, but I think that the, the Spanish audience was extremely passionate. Oh, yeah. Uh, it really depends very much on the venue, too. For example, she says Spanish audience. Well, we, sp we performed at uh, Teatro Real, which is one of the producers of the piece. It's an opera house. And... Uh, they had uh, Gerard Mortier there to start programming things to kind of give new life to the opera house. And he was doing some very unconventional operas. And we were part of the program. Uh, so you had a public that was normally you know, going to see Aida and Traviata and stuff like that. And then they see this. Uh, it turned out well. They were open to it. It was. Um, framed in the right way that they could see it and enjoy it. Uh, but it's very much conditioned by the place, as you might think. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think. That's true. Yeah, because the piece, the piece is, is because Bob works so formally, um, and it's quite precise, uh, it, the piece remains quite similar from place to place. We only have to make very little adjustments with the uh, physical space. That is all that we do. Sorry, one second. Sorry, this, this may be shallow, but uh, I'd love to know about the makeup and how that the idea of that came along. And the because I see you're doing something else at BAM later mm -hmm. on in, with the same idea. Similar, similar, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's sort of a trademark thing of Bob because he, he usually works in quite big spaces. He really believes that he, he wants to lift things up. He wants to be able to see the faces. You know, the faces, that you can't see expressions, but if you've got big black eyebrows and your real eyebrows go up, those big painted black eyebrows will go up. It's really about eyes and mouths and being able to see facial expressions. And also, I, like, I think he likes the theatricality of it. I mean. Bob's mantra is he doesn't like anything natural. He likes things, he believes that you can get, well, I, I won't put words in his mouth, but the sense is he, what he's interested in is getting through, getting to things, getting to the truth of things, the, the, his way of seeing things through artificiality. And uh, after working with him, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with him very much. I mean, it's a, when things are heightened, you can take all the kind of, kind of personality and garbage stuff away that makes it feel like life and can put your feet to the fire and really look at the nature of things. But also he project light. So you have to have this white, the, the face is a canvas basically and he project the light on this. And this makeup takes about two to three hours to put on every single day, just to let you know. And you never can wash it. I come home and it's always somewhere in my ear. Oh. And by the way, I have a great experience today. When I was in the bed scene, which is a very quiet scene, I had a, I don't know from where, but the fly go into my, into my uh, ear. Yeah. I was thinking it's going to go into my brain. And this was pretty much the discipline not to move. <laughs> she really was inside the ear. 
Yeah, but you've had a lot of practice not moving, so. I am yeah. zen, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> if anyone could do it, could do it. And I think that, that uh, you know, to us is very important, Anthony, that is not with us here to talk tonight, but Anthony, music, it's kept this incredible emotional impact, even if the Bob would like to make it dry and to make distant and cold and, you know, and with humor. But then comes Anthony and everything goes like, Whoa. you know, that's, for me, Anthony is, so Anthony is very important and also the Slavic singers because they give me that emotional impact that I need that actually is everything about Slavic soul, which I come from. I mean, we are this type of people, we go to the movie and we don't cry, the movie is not good. We have to cry. <laughs> it's true. I didn't know that. Oh yes, crying is a big deal. I, there was, uh, just to tell you how different you are from, like an American critic who is a friend of mine, he said to me, I hate your work. I said, why? Because you always make me cry. I mean, you know, you want to, they, but mostly Americans want to take these things at the intellectual level, but they doesn't want to be kind of punched in the stomach. Really? Yeah. Did you cry this, with this piece? No, I cried everything, so yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, this is why you're talking to us, you see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you can really. <laughs> you can, if anything, it's, it's a exception. problem. Um, I, I thought something popped up. It looked like a human. No? Um, I was wondering, um, it was, uh, you started with the idea for the, for the play. Um, your work as an artist uh, seems to me that you uh, have something special to give to the audience. And I was wondering with this play, what is it that you would like to give to the audience? What would you like to happen to the audience? But you know, again, this is theater and my work is not theater but I'm playing in the theater of my life. And that you have to ask actually Bob Wilson because this is his play and I'm just his tool. And I think what he wanted, if I can talk about it with him because I talk about these ideas with him, I think that he would like to give this, you know, this very, to take the biography, in this case is mine, but it can be anybody else, and create really the, something transcendental that everybody else can project his own life. It's, the, it's very abstract biography. And I think he succeeded this, and I'm quite happy what he done. That is not anymore about me, but it was anybody else in this audience. And that's different than my own work, which is a very different story. There's something, uh, oh. Um, yeah. Uh, to, to both, uh, both of you, um, as, as artists, um, I, I know, Marina, you've talked about, you know, your vision and the strength of your vision, and one, one who's seen your work knows the strength of your vision that has propelled you through your life, and William, you have worked endlessly in so many different ways, but as artists, have there ever been times when that vision has flagged or you've reached a place where you just think, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing or why I'm doing this, and these sort of fallow periods. And have they been there? And if so, how have you wended your way through them or used them uh, to move on? Willem, you, <laughs> monsieur. Not so much, you know, I think there's periods where you know, you have rich opportunities and periods where you have less rich opportunities. I'm a person that likes to collaborate with people. I, I, as an actor, I'm not an interpreter. I like being the thing. I like making things with people. So one of the sad things about being an actor this way is you need other people to do what you love to do. Sometimes there are lots of things to do. Sometimes there are less things to do. But I can honestly say that whenever I'm doing, whenever I'm engaged and I'm with people that I like to be around, I'm, I'm never bored or never stuck. I'm, something's always happening. It's always, it's only those times where you feel uh, frustrated that you aren't finding the right people in the right situations. But I don't know, maybe I, I, I trick myself too because I like to work. So once I, you know, 
w once you get in movement, then inspiration comes. Inspiration doesn't bring movement. I think it's you got to get stuff moving, and then once you move, stuff starts to happen. Okay, I'm very big on failure. I think failure is so important. <laughs> to f you, you, how you can go to unknown territory if you've never been, if you don't also include the fa that you can fail. And uh, if you always go on a secure situation that you know you have to take this and these elements and you have this certain result, first is boring, second is repeating yourself, and the third is totally uninteresting for you. So you have to kind of charge yourself and, and bring the different, different ideas and see if they work or not. But you can only do if you're doing them. And then you can, in the process, fail. So I think the failure is a very important part of creativity, which people don't really easily accept. I, my favorite story is this one, totally relating to something else. Columbus, okay. He, so what happened to Columbus? He went to this El Hierro little island in, um, in, the, in Spain where he had the last meal with the convicts who had been in the little ship that they're supposed to go and find uh, the, the shorter route to go to India to get the spices for the queen of, of Spain. And they, had the, and they had this night there before they're going to completely to unknown way to, to find if this route exists or not. But what is interesting that the, the idea of the Earth in those days was that Earth was a plate and you can fall off from the planet because there was not even idea that the Earth was round. So can you imagine that night of these guys having this last meal and they are going to go to find a new way to India, but actually they can fall from Earth? I think this is more courageous to me than going to the moon. And then what happened? They find America and there you are. So can you imagine? That was courageous moment. So you have to go to unknown. How do you like that story? <laughs> we are can. Okay. I saw some rustling. Ready? Oh, over here. So tell us what you imagine in Columbus last night before he went on the boat, on the ship. <laughs> what, what, what? I didn't understand. What? You just talk about Columbus the yes. night before. What do you imagine he went through? Oh my God, I, I'm even thinking to, to make some, some work about that. I, that must be, can you imagine? I mean, this convicts was there, so they have to anyway go because they, they've been out of prison, so they didn't have a choice. But he had a choice, but he really went to that. So this is really, I think that this is a man with vision and warrior, and that's something very inspiring. You have to have such a people who go to the unknown territory, who can really have this vision and also take the possibility that they can die. It's a big deal. Not too many people are like this. So it's the but next, they are, so it's ro the next they are to me, is a role model, let's say. <laughs> Columbus will be a role model. There's a, um, just to leap backwards for a moment, thinking of, of your early work, um, the Worcester Group and thinking of you beginning your work, something that I, it seems very simple, but, um, and if people know this, forgive me, but um, not repeating things seemed to be so important to the, to the work that you- In the 70s. In the 70s. Now we are 2014, 13. Right, you know, it's not all one thing, but I thought that was, that was a, a really, I mean, a simple, but a really fascinating thing to stumble across reading about your work and thinking what that would have been like in the 70s, that theater in some ways was not the enemy, but the, the inverse of what you were trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that accurate or is that? No, no, it's accurate. It was very important to hate theater in order to establish performance. It's like you have to hate your parents in order to establish your identity, so it's the same. So now, now you guys are cool. And now I'm fine. I, yeah. I make my own language in performance. I'm very, I'm extremely flexible about theater. I mean, because in opera, theater, whatever, you know, that's, but first it's very important to, to, to create your own strict rules and to, that to define them. And then you can, you can be open to other things. And when, and when you were beginning, what was the perception of performance art from the theater? 
community? I, we weren't a traditional theater. Um, we weren't performance art. We didn't know what we were. We were a bunch of people making things in a room. So very avant-garde, by so the way. Huh? Very avant-garde, yeah. very important. So that was a, dis a distinction that wouldn't have worried you at all? No, I mean, the, the interesting thing about the early days of, uh, of the Wooster Group is they, they were, uh, it was a group of people that were making things uh, that we were using theater forms, but the impulse wasn't, uh, weren't, it wasn't a traditional theater. And we were not people that were trained in theater, and we were also not people that were, had, were career minded. Every piece that we did, we thought was going to be the last. Now, when you do that for 25 <laughs> years, you, you start to say, well, <laughs> I don't quite believe this, you know. Um, that's maybe why I'm not there now, <laughs> but, uh, you know. Huh. I think we have time for one last audience. There's, oh. Yeah, I um, wanted to first of all report that that fly that you were talking about is back here now. <laughs> uh, that's important. Yeah, that's so the fly is with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've always... I'm a folklorist, and I've always been interested... Oh, the mic. Oh. I think we can... The change. fly is with us, that's a good one. I think it's for the last. I, I'm a folklorist, and I've always been interested, Marina, in... Um, the ways that your work has commented on Slavic folklore and Slavic folk culture. And I wondered if you would just speak to that a little bit, you know, sort of where Slavic folk culture plays in your, in your thinking about what you do and a number of the pieces that you've done that sort of have reference points that I don't think a lot of people really understand that, that that's... It is what the best. I mean, the, I think the best example for me was definitely the the work I made called Balkan Erotic Epic, which yeah. kind of is hilarious too. But you know, it was really important to me to to look into the roots of culture and to see the old rituals and to see the the things that we forgot even exist from 14th century, 17th century, and and I really uh, restaged them, and they are very big uh, inspiration for me. But you see. I took the, because I come from there, I understand the, also the, the, the drama of that, but also the huge humor of this whole thing. And the, some of these rituals would not be even made these two days because you were put in prison, so I have to make a, a the cartoon out of them. So it's kind of easier to get them. But like, uh, I don't know, the, the, I want this very simple, a simple example that it's very difficult to understand. You know, we are always thinking of porno in another way, and I try to prove that actually the, the, the the, the sexual organs of men and women in the, in the 14th, 15th century and earlier, they've been used as a tools for to connect with the divine energies and not as a porno material, we're using them now. So the one of the ritual that I actually replay, it took me two years to cast the people and to actually explain to them what to do and they can really, um, how you call, accept it morally. It, and I have the women of 86 years old till the Till the, till the 15, the girls. And the ritual is like this one, that if it's uh, lots of rain and, uh, in, the, in the villages and the rain continues to start going on and on, it will be huge floods. And the old crop and the, all the corn and wheat, whatever they, they, they grow, they will be wasted and people not anything to eat. So the only rituals in those days they believe that will stop the rain is if the, all the women from the village will go out on the rain and, and lift their skirts and show their vaginas to the God to make, them af to make God afraid of their vagina to stop the rain. It's an amazing ritual, and i done it as a film. Does it work? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, <laughs> this is typical American disbeliever question. Of course what? Okay, can I, can I? Okay, listen. I Where were you tell, last night? Wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me. <laughs> Let me tell you Bob Wilson's story. That's not in my story, exactly. not Balkan culture, but this is Indonesia. So that's the story. He's in Indonesia and he's rehearsing. It's the very, it's a kind of outdoor theater, and it's raining every day. It's a kind of monsoon, and it's like all the costumes are getting, you know, wet, and it's like smell and terrible. And the, the king is coming for premiere, and they're raining like three weeks all the time. So the cook of the, the who is preparing meals for the cast said to the Bob, but why you don't why you don't inv invite the rainmaker and he can stop the rain? 
And Bob said, do you know anybody, any rainmaker? Get the guy. And he said, oh yeah, my cousin is rainmaker. So he get his cousin, he negotiate the price, Bob pay for the price. The guy come and he made some bamboo jumbo and he, 24 hours, the rain stopped. And they are working for three, four days with no rain at all. So everything is fine. But then cook, the, the, the guy who is the cousin of the cook, find out that the, actually he made different price, the, the cook. He took more money mm -hmm. and he gave him less money. So he got angry, they had a the big fight and he left and start raining again. <laughs> and so now, so now, now the king is coming in two days and he's really desperate, is what you're going to do. And the cook said, but don't worry because king, he have his own rainmaker, so it will be okay. So the day of performance, the rainmaker of the king come in the morning, stop the rain, they had the performance, and then the rain starts again. So you see, this is Bob's story from Indonesia, not even mine. It sounds a lot like Brooklyn, but okay. It's, it's different, you know, this, you have vagina in, in my country, you have different... No, they're here too, no, they're different. <laughs> I don't think we can get a better end than that. Different tool. we're using different tools. But let's, let's, let's say something like wobbly, and then we finish tonight. What you can say, say, say something can, wobbly? Yeah, can you put some kind of wrap this together in some intellectual way? <laughs> I, bet, I, I bet that Willem could. No, no, I'm listening. No, no, we are, we, are, we are just the guests. You saw the piece, you tell us what you think. Um, I just, uh, I guess it's fairly simple, um, especially the fourth time. Um, it's, uh, I just think the death, the death is, is, a, is a thing that's either very far away in the future or very far away in the past. It never feels, it never feels anything like a funeral. It never feels anything like, I was thinking about that, that um, there's always this sort of, um, you said it yourself, that you know, things are, are turned into either a, a mournful, you know, sad thing or a celebration and I think I don't think this is either. I don't think this is, it's somewhere suspended between the two. And maybe that's Bob, maybe that's Bob's wanting, you know, that love of abstraction, that love of, of you know, his, his circles, the white lights, the way that people rarely touch. This time I was, I was trying to figure out if there's a moment where you guys actually touch each other. I get distracted, but it feels very much like it's, it's right between the two, it's mm -hmm. sort of like, life itself, it's not a massive celebration. I mean, you end with a, with a volcano of snow, what's that? Yeah. So that's my completely coherent summation of the show. <laughs> that's perfect. I think we have to go to sleep. Mm. <laughs> At least me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.